One of the things that people are so often drawn to in Dutch and Flemish paintings from this period is their extraordinarily lifelike detail. The almost photographic precision of many paintings can give the impression that they are entirely realistic transcriptions of life as it was in the 17th century. Now, while there is certainly an element of reality in these paintings, they are nonetheless artistic constructs, fictions. I think it helps to consider them as we would a novel, based on truth and life experience, but drawing on the author's imagination to craft a specific vision, an improved and highly selective view of reality, if you will. In this brief introduction to the exhibition, I'll use a handful of paintings to explore instances in which an artist might have manipulated aspects of the scene to heighten their importance or edited out other, less desirable features. What did these choices mean to viewers in the 17th century? And how can an understanding of these choices help us today to decode the paintings and see that really the priorities, pleasures, and concerns of people in the 17th century are not so different from those we have today? The painting I would like to start off with is one of the earliest in the exhibition, a large winter scene by the Amsterdam painter Adam van Brain, painted in 1611. Colorful and highly detailed, it's virtually a catalog of winter activities. The artist chose to imagine the scene as observed from an elevated viewpoint in order to fit in as much detail as possible. The painting shows a frozen waterway on the outskirts of Amsterdam. A profile of the city is just visible on the horizon. And the scene is filled with dozens of figures who have all taken to the ice on the wintry day. From the 1300s until the late 1800s, Europe experienced what has become known as the Little Ice Age, with especially frigid winters that, in Northern Europe, caused canals and waterways to freeze solid. The prolonged cold could make life miserable in many ways, but the resourceful Dutch found that travel across the ice was often easier, and the frozen expanse was an ideal place to play games and to socialize. It was actually one of the few occasions when people from all classes of society mixed freely. We see a bit of that in Van Brain's painting, where there are all sorts of costumes and modes of travel, some of them a bit more practical than others. The red and black jacket worn by the young man in this detail indicates that he was an orphan of the city of Amsterdam. Red and black were the city's colors. Skating towards him is a man who seems to tow a woman behind him. And in the foreground, a child propels himself along on a sled, while in the background, we can see that two skaters have taken a bit of a tumble. Thanks to recent research, it's been possible to identify the exact location of this scene on the outskirts of Amsterdam. The mill to the right of the painting was a sawmill, and the large country house to the left behind that painted fence was owned by a prominent Amsterdam industrialist. Quite different in spirit and in intent is this winter scene by Jan van Goyen, painted a generation later in 1646. From the mid-1620s, Van Goyen was a leader in introducing a more naturalistic style of landscape painting in the Netherlands. Rather than employing vivid colors and an unnaturally elevated viewpoint to try and fit in as much detail as possible, Van Goyen presented a more true-to-life image of the muted colors and subtle topographical variations of the native Dutch landscape. In this characteristic example, apart from patches of brilliant blue in the sky, Van Goyen's palette is limited to just a few shades of brown and gray. You really get the sense of a cold, blustery day. And a closer look at the figures at the base of the wooden tower shows them dressed in pretty drab colors, and I think everyone there has their hands tucked close to their bodies for warmth. Rather than showing wintry weather as an opportunity for pleasant recreation, Van Goyen looks more critically at its harsh realities. None of these figures appear to be having fun, and that they're only out in this weather because they have to be for work or for travel. 
Although the composition is quite simple, von Hoyen's brushwork is extraordinarily. Swirling strokes in the sky suggest clouds changing shape as they're propelled by a swift breeze, while the thin, sketchy strokes of brown paint used to describe the trees, the house, and the structure at the base of the observation tower remind us, in part, of the limited range of construction materials available to most people at this time. The quick, sketchy character of Jan van Hoyen's brush strokes might also suggest that this painting was painted on the spot. But like most, if not all of his works, it was painted in the studio, often basing some of the features, like the observation tower seen here, on drawings he had made outdoors. While we're on the subject of winter scenes, I'd like to share with you the exhibition's Outlier, a work by the British painter John Ward of Hull, called The Northern Whale Fishery, The Swan and Isabella. It was painted in 1840, almost two centuries after von Hoyen's I seen. Despite the obvious differences of geography and chronology, the painting closely resembles Dutch marine paintings of the 17th century in its attention to detail and its interest in recreating atmospheric effects. As his name implies, Ward was based in the city of Hull in Northeast England, which at the time was an important center for maritime activities, particularly whaling, and a point of departure for countless exploratory Arctic voyages. The two ships depicted here, the Swan to the left and the Isabella to the right, both described in minute detail, were famous for having survived some harrowing adventures in the Arctic. Ward himself never traveled to the Arctic, but he based paintings like this on the accounts of local sailors who had, and also on published descriptions. His lack of on-site experience adds a very personal charm to his recreations of the frozen waters off the coast of Greenland. This painting is remarkable for the number and variety of creatures he depicted. I particularly love the narwhals with their impossibly long tusks and the equally fantastical ice formations that look like frozen fountains from the sea. Of course, the Dutch were great explorers as well, and in the 17th century, this small nation became perhaps the greatest maritime power in Europe, largely thanks to groundbreaking mega conglomerates, namely the Dutch East India Company and the Dutch West India Company, which colonized and traded in Asia and the Americas respectively, the Dutch developed an unprecedentedly vast and profitable trading network. This brought wealth and an improved standard of living to many, although admittedly not all, Dutch citizens. And many of the paintings produced during this period are demonstrations of the enormous pride felt by citizens of the Young Republic and an urge to commemorate what they had managed to achieve in such a short amount of time. A painting like Peter Klaas's magnificent Still Life with Peacock Pie of 1627 represents an exuberant celebration of this abundance. We see a tabletop covered with two cloths, a red patterned one topped by a crisp white linen and laden with a veritable feast, a blue and white Chinese porcelain bowl filled with fruit and another with capers in the background, metal platters holding a roasted bird, cut and whole lemons, and a selection of sweets, bread, nuts, a flagon and glass of wine, and of course, that incredible peacock pie, which I'll get to in a minute. Klaus has introduced a number of details to animate this so-called still life. The crumpled napkin and tipped glass, as well as the plate overhanging the edge of the table in the foreground, suggest the sudden departure of a human presence. It's important to note that this still light does not represent an actual meal, but rather it's an assembly of the finest and most costly luxuries that might be had, if you could afford them. Not only did this give the artist an opportunity to show off his skill in painting different textures, ceramic and glass, metal and fabric, feather and fruit, but it also functioned as a veritable catalog of the luxury goods that were available delicate porcelains imported from China, citrus from the Mediterranean, sugar and salt in the gilded cellar 
were commodities imported from the Americas, where their production was reliant upon enslaved labor, which was, of course, a really abhorrent component of the Dutch trading empire. The standout, though, is that peacock pie. Recipe books from the 1600s give instructions on how to make one of these pies, which involved removing the bird's head and neck, wings and tail feathers, and carefully preparing them. Before serving the pie, which was a pastry crust filled with a rich stew made from the meat of the bird, the head, wings, and tail feathers were attached to the pie with sticks or wires. Kloss makes this impressive centerpiece even more striking by inserting, somewhat improbably, a delicate pink rose in the bird's beak. Other still lives in the exhibition are more modest in scale and depict natural beauties from closer to home. This unusual floral still life by Clara Paters is less than seven inches tall and is painted with absolutely extraordinary detail. The central oval shows a simple glass filled with just a few spring flowers, pansy, anemone, snake's head fritillary, lily of the valley, and grape hyacinth. Delicate droplets of water on leaves and petals catch the light. All of these flowers were cultivated in the Netherlands at the time, and I like to imagine Pater simply gathering a handful of fresh flowers from her garden to guide her in painting this work. What's unusual about the painting, though, is that this central oval is surrounded by a creamy, off-white painted field on which several insects and a snail are symmetrically arranged. There are no precedents for this sort of composition in paintings, but perhaps Pater's was inspired by illuminated manuscripts from earlier centuries, which sometimes surrounded an image with a scattering of insects and flowers so realistically painted, they seem to actually be marching across the page of the book. It's well known that flowers and paintings often carry emblematic meanings, and that may be the case here as well. Many of the flowers and insects Paters depicted were traditionally invested with Christian symbolism. The red anemone, for example, was associated with the blood of Christ. This charming and inventive painting was made when Paters, only a handful of women painters active professionally in the Netherlands during the 17th century, was only about 18 years old. She signed it with her name, Clara P., just below the glass of flowers. This is a painting by Jan Jans van de Velde III. It is a smoking still life. It was a particular sort of specialty of the Dutch in the 17th century. And what we have here is a small painting on panel painted almost in monochrome using just a limited range of gray, brown, and creamy white. So we have this um, earthenware jug. We have next to it a brazier of coals, and in front of that a twist of paper with some tobacco in it, and right in the foreground a long clay pipe. And if you look closely just in front of the pipe, there's the ember that's fallen out of the bowl, and you see a tiny wisp of smoke rising from it. It's incredibly subtle detailing. So Enlivening this monochrome aspect are the touches of brilliant red in the coals in the brazier and in that glowing ember just in front of the pipe. Now, the subject of this painting I mentioned is something unique to the Netherlands in the 17th century, and I think this is largely because of the Dutch role in the tobacco trade. The Dutch brought from English plantations in this area, in Maryland and Virginia, they imported tobacco back to the Netherlands where they pro processed it and then turned it over for a very tidy profit, selling it to the remainder of Europe. So this subject became very popular in art and also in everyday life. We know that tobacco use was widespread in the 17th century. The second painting I'd like to share with you today is this lovely still life by Adrian Corta, which came to the gallery just last year, so it's absolutely brand new. It was painted by the artist in 1687. It depicts a bunch of grapes suspended by a cord. 
It's a remarkable composition, so you get a sense of the weight of the grapes as they pull that chord taut. Corta used that bunch of grapes really as an exercise to demonstrate his skill in using light and shadow to create a sense of the three-dimensionality of the grapes and the translucence of each individual globe. He used a single brown grape at the center of that bunch to kind of punctuate the mass, you know, just as we would add punctuation to a body of text to give it a definition and a, a sort of pause in the middle. He contrasts the roundness and the, the volume of those grapes with this incredibly delicate, almost calligraphic tendril of the grapevine, which just scribbles in a way across the background of the painting and captures beneath the two strands that beautiful blue butterfly. It really is poetry in paint. The final thing that I want to draw your attention to has to do with his use of light. The light enters the composition from the left-hand side of the scene, cascading over each of those individual grapes and rounding their forms. And then in the very background, at the upper right corner, you see a halo of light that gives us a sense of the space within the room. It's such a subtle and sophisticated rendering of the effects of light on form. The category of Dutch painting that offers the richest material for a consideration of their supposed realism are genre paintings, or scenes that claim to depict everyday life. And I'd like to take a look at just a couple of examples from the exhibition to see how different artists blended truth and fiction in their paintings. It's a familiar device. Then, as now, artists and writers commonly employed familiar objects, settings, or character types in their works to more easily and directly convey symbolic or moralizing messages or to construct a believable fantasy. This luminous painting by Jakob Achterveld from 1663 depicts a nurse and a child in the foyer of an elegant urban home. The child in the long dress is actually a boy. During this time, up until about age five or six, dresses were worn by both boys and girls. We know that this child is a boy because of the gold medal he wears on a chain slung across his chest. Another detail about his costume to note are the long strips of cloth that hang from the shoulders of his garment. These were called leading strings, and they could be held by an adult to help support the child as they learn to walk. Here, the boy's hand is held by the, his nurse as he drops a coin into the tattered hat held by the raggedly dressed boy who stands just outside the doorway. Just behind that boy is a woman suckling an infant, presumably the boy's mother and sibling. The shadowy appearance of this compact family group on the doorstep contrasts strongly and deliberately with the crisp, clean appearance of the home's occupants. Notice the abundance of white linen garments and gleaming marble floors. Although there are elements of this painted interior that correspond to common features of an upscale urban home in the Netherlands in the late 17th century, Achterveld cleaned it up a bit to emphasize the clean, clear geometry of the spaces and to heighten the contrast between the sometimes harsh realities of the outside world and the safe haven of home and family. In reality, most Dutch homes would have been more dimly lit and crowded with furniture and possessions. Another artistic construct. The elegantly dressed young boy in Achterveld's painting might well be a portrait although it's not been possible to identify him, but it surrounds the boy in an invented context designed to emphasize the importance of charity in Dutch society and of assimilating those lessons at a very young age. Achterveld's talent lies in giving us a scene that's probably, perhaps apart from the figure of the young boy, entirely invented, but which appears to us and to viewers in the 17th century as a completely plausible reality. 
that believability, I think, makes it easier and more natural to take on board the lesson it embodies about charity and civic responsibility. The other genre painting I would like to discuss is a very recent acquisition by the Lee and Juliet Folger Fund, which entered the collection of the National Gallery of Art just last year in 2020. It's a delightful Mary Company by Dirk Hals, painted in 1625. Now, the National Gallery of Art already owns several major works by Dirk's older brother, Franz Hals, but this is the first work by Dirk to enter the collection. Like Ochtervelt's painting, this scene represents a delightful fantasy. Four fabulously dressed young men and women are gathered on a terrace before a view of still water bordered by lush trees. One woman plays a lute, the man plays a cello, which was a very popular musical pairing. And the other couple seems to simply appreciate the entertainment. In the background at left, a young man lays out the making of a grand picnic, including another bird pie, but this time it's turkey, not peacock. What grabs our attention immediately is the colorful clothing worn by the figures in the foreground, which seems so unlike what we usually think of when we think of 17th century Dutch paintings, which is mostly sober men and women dressed exclusively in black and white. But actually, in the 1620s, when this painting was made, wealthy young people were noted for the colorful and sometimes absolutely flamboyant dress that they flaunted. Just take a look at those shining silks and delicate laces, the rows of ribbon bows and the fluffy ostrich feather plumes, all painted with quick and assured brush strokes that impart a certain liveliness to these details. The back of this woman's costume seems to show, in bright blue, the elaborate construction that was needed to support her immense rough collar. And this is exactly the sort of hidden detail that signals the artist's remarkable attentiveness to the minutia of contemporary fashion. And yet, as in Ochtervelt's painting, the scene itself is a confection unlikely to have existed in reality. The verdant setting suggests the grounds of an expansive country estate. And while those did exist and people did enjoy outdoor picnics and musical entertainments, those experiences were largely restricted to the very wealthy, the 1% of the 1%. For middling wealthy people, owning a painting like this would have represented the closest they would ever come to living that dream. Dirk Hall's painting is, in that sense, aspirational, a compilation of all the individual elements that, for a viewer in the 1600s, would have constituted the ideal summer afternoon. Fine weather, a relaxing outdoor setting, fashionable clothing, musical entertainment, good food, and good company. Really, is that so different to what we might aspire to today? The exhibition features 27 paintings acquired by the National Gallery of Art over the past quarter century thanks to the generosity of the Lee and Juliet Folger Fund, as well as one painting from the personal collection of Lee and Juliet Folger. Individually and as a group, the paintings were selected for their artistic quality and their exemplary state of preservation. Choices were guided as well by the painting's ability to express key aspects of the history of the North and South Netherlands. For example, Dutch maritime power and trading acumen, which gave this tiny nation international recognition and access to a vast array of imported goods. Another collecting interest was the so-called Little Ice Age, expressed in paintings that show how, with remarkable fortitude, people dealt with this prolonged climactic period of relentlessly cold weather. Most of all, the paintings in the Folger Fund collection convey an enthusiasm for life, a sense of positivity and optimism that is still apparent four centuries after their creation. Individually and as a collection, they represent the remarkable achievement of a broad range of extraordinarily talented Dutch and Flemish artists of the 17th century. <laughs>